Man is given the task of coping with mortality, not only his own, but also that of all other constituents of his world. All events are transitory by nature. They come and go, and among the events there is man's own being. And many works of his own hands and those of nature are sadly perishable. The ephemeral character of things is of two kinds. As physical objects or happenings, they hold their place in the chronological history of the world. A continent, an animal, a work of art is generated and lives out its space of existence. Additionally, however, in relation to man as a perceiver, a physical thing can enter his consciousness by being seen or heard, in which case any moment of its existence is limited to a corresponding moment in the observer's mind. Since only one of those moments is accessible to observation at any time, existence as a target of direct perception is only the differential of time we call the present moment. Elsewhere, I have pointed to the startling fact that any organized entity, in order to be grasped as a whole by the mind, must be translated into the synoptic condition of space. This means, presumably, a translation into visual imagery, since the sense of sight is the only one that offers spatial simultaneity of reasonably complex patterns. Accordingly, a musical composition, a choreography, a novel, a play, or a film, in order to be con conceived as a whole, must be available in the form of a synoptic image, although the medium may be oral and the structure to be scrutinized not an immobile picture, but a succession of events in time. This becomes obvious if one considers that one cannot even establish the center point of a line without knowing its total length. Correspondingly, if a musical composition were made up moment by moment without any conception of a larger whole, it could only be a loose improvisation, raw material perhaps for something to be organized later. And a listener who perceives only what strikes his ear at any particular instant cannot comprehend anything of the whole piece except perhaps its overall texture. In its early state, the mental conception of a work of art tends to be a rather abstract pattern and probably largely a synoptic one. Only when the conception approaches the particular properties of the final medium, the synoptic simultaneity of the total pattern, whose overall structure is by then established, begins to recede. More and more explicit sequences are now established. And by the time the music is played, the play is performed, the printed novel is read, the work has entered the dimension of time. It now offers in turn to the listener a view, uh, to, to the listener, a viewer or reader, the task of comprehending the sequence as a coherent whole. The task of the recipient is the reverse of that of the creator of the work. He must integrate the temporal succession and translate it into a spatial image. This sort of operation takes place not only when one listens to a piece of music or reads a novel, but in a broader sense also when one copes with the mortality of the present moment quite in general in regard to anything one wishes to understand, the events of history, the relations between things distant in, in time and space, the course of one's own life and work. <clears throat> 
In each case, the peephole vistas, the point-sized observations must be gathered in a surveyable hole. And the instrument by which the mind accomplishes this translation of time into space is what psychologists call memory. And this is actually mostly a lecture of, of, on memory, which I'm giving you tonight. The physiological basis of memory is still poorly understood, even in its most elementary features. Are the traces of specific experiences located in specific places of the brain, as some clinical observations suggest? Are they field processes spread over bra broad brain areas and dependent on overall organization? Or is this totality of memory holdings perhaps completely represented in every particular area of the brain, like a hologram? Whatever the answer, one fact is indisputable, namely that the inputs arriving in temporal succession are stored in some sort of spatial arrangement and that correspondingly the human mind can confront and compare images in simultaneity. Memory enables a person not only to perform in his head an entire symphony for the mind's ear, in which case the sequence is preserved, but also to survey the structural pattern of the whole composition like a landscape spread before the eyes with all its formations. Surely this second ability is the more admirable one. It is less mechanical. Rather than a simple reproduction, it is a structural abstraction and translation which alone enables us to overcome the instant mortality of time and to view relations. The term memory does not cover very well the various mental feats it designates. In its more primitive version, memory does not enable the mind to look back into the past, but merely modifies presently given facts by what has been learned about them. For a cat or a dog, experience imbues the sight of the open, co of the open coat closet or the sound of the refrigerator door with a sense of pleasure. There need not be any reminiscence of the past events that justify the joyful anticipation. The trace survives in its modified form as though it had been marked as a releaser by an innate instinct, a deposit of evolution. And similarly, a painting of which one has been told that it is a forgery, or that instead of being the work of a minor Dutch portraitist, it is by Rembrandt, changes into a different perceptual object. And again, in principle, this can happen although the historical event that caused the change has been forgotten. This ongoing modification of the things and events constituting the present is the effect of trace survival, but not of memory in the sense of reminiscence. As far as we can tell, man is the only creature capable of doing better, namely of moving from the present to some remembered event of the past to conjure up the image of an absent or diseased person or of a distant or lost object and consider it presently also as something absent. This facility for storage and retrieval enables a person to deal actively with a vast amount of his past inputs as though they were constituents of his world even now. But even this superior feat of survival is insufficiently described as memory, because what the mind actually possesses is not simply a reservoir of images, but rather what we usually call imagination, an inner world generated largely from experiences of the past, but not limited to their reproduction. <clears throat> 
Imagination uses such material for creating images of its own. It is not limited to the chronology of the dates of arrival in memory. In fact, it can dispense with the time index entirely and treat its images as timeless. Since information arrives at the mind in sequence, one might expect its traces to preserve this sequential character somehow. The more automatic and elementary the storing process, the more that should be the case. But actually, more nearly the opposite is true. The more elementary form of imagery consists of static configurations. Being is a simpler concept than becoming. And any notion involving change, such as a sense of history, calls for a more sophisticated level of the mind. The understanding of a situation tends to develop from an image of static coexistence to one involving causal relations. At early stages of learning, a student of art history, for example, may conceive of the painters of the Quattrocento as a mere set of individuals. Mantegna, and Raphael, Gentile da Fabriano, Piero della Francesca, all in the same boat. Only gradually does he begin to see the causal relations that require a sequential order. However, non-sequential conceptions also may be highly structured, and they are not only the early ones, but also the late ones. The early ones do not yet conceive of sequence, and the late ones transcend it and neglect it as ephemeris. Hence, the power of such visions as that of Plato's idola, his ideas, or that of Dante's architectural structure of vices and virtues, which classifies human types regardless of historical location. Note here further that the difference, the difference between non-sequential and sequential images of the world is also a matter of stylistic preference, which induces observers to see reality in either the one or the other way. Thus Schopenhauer commits himself to a classicist ontology when he writes, quote, there is no greater contrast than that between the irresistible flight of time, which carries with it its, its entire content, and the rigid immobility of the actually existing, which remains one and the same at all time. It pays to study the nature of the dynamics in semi-sequential systems. For example, when Thomas Mann, in his biblical novel of Joseph and his brothers, tells the story of the Hebrew forefathers, he compares the sequence of generations from Abraham through Jacob to Joseph with that of promontories, appearing one after the other as one walks along a sea coast, an intrinsically spatial image in which similarity, repetition, and imitation are as relevant as the temporal sequence. In fact, the sequence of the sites can be reversed or otherwise altered. <clears throat> Tradition and prophecy are exchangeable. Even, even in its chronological order, this sequence of generations is not neutral. In Thomas Mann's story, the sequence uh, derives its dynamics from the emphasis on the progenitor, Abraham, the man from Ur of the Chaldees, the first embodiment of a pattern that is reenacted in the behavior of his descendants. The arrows run the other way. When the emphasis is not on the beginning but on the end of the series, as for examples in the prefigurations of Christ drawn from the Old Testament. Here, the dynamics of the power structure is not that of an imitation of what has been, but of an anticipation discovered in retrospect. 
It will be evident that in all these examples, the image is essentially spatial, in that the conception of the patterns presupposes the simultaneous presence of all components, which thereby become available for a synoptic overview. Historical situations are perceived as though they were landscapes or paintings, a comparison that helps us understand the nature of dynamic relations within spatial configurations. The overall pattern of a painting is pervaded by strongly dynamic forces which hold the composition together. They relate the parts to one another without letting them fuse, and animate the whole display of pictorial matter by a system of variously directed vectors. All these forces operate within the spatial simultaneity and are quite independent of the exploring glance of the viewer's eyes, which move in a time sequence unrelated to the structure of the painting. In the same way, the mental image of a historical period, a musical composition, or a novel, is pervaded by a spatial equivalent of the time arrow. This directedness is experienced as a feature of the image and is, as in the painting, unrelated to the scanning action by which it is scrutinized at will. The image may be laid out as an array readable from the left to the right like a musical score, or when the imagined sequence involves the station point of the observer, past or future can be represented by spatial distance as in traditional episodic paintings in which the events, of preceding, in which the events preceding the foreground scene or following from it are depicted as smaller and more distant in the background, as in those narrative paintings of the 15th century, which you might remember. Since memory is a biological instrument developed in evolution for a definite purpose, it cannot collect things indiscriminately like a waste basket. It must operate intelligently, and therefore the automatic accession and limited preservation of, of every item of information received by the organism would not be a suitable procedure. I made a mistake, I have to mark that. I want to say, <laughs> I want to say, it must operate in, um, intelligently, therefore the automatic accession and unlimited preservation of every item of, 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 of information received by the organism would not be a suitable procedure. Accession must depend on the value of the item for the organism, and the length of the item's survival in the mind must depend on its impact and usefulness. If at this point of our consideration we glance at the religious doctrine of the survival of the soul in the afterlife, we realize that the ontological difference between the purely psychological survival in the memories of posterity and, on the other hand, the independent persistence of an entity after death in the physical world is not of fundamental importance for our purpose. What does matter, however, is whether the belief in survival operates as a mere primitive extension of a biological instinct of survival and therefore grants unlimited persistence beyond death automatically to every specimen of mankind, or whether survival is made dependent on some respectable value for the surviving entity itself, and for the rest of the world. If then the images of human memory are governed by intelligent discrimination, they are constrained nevertheless by the biological and physical facts that control the world of things to be perceived and remembered. By the standards of reason, many of these facts look arbitrary and meaningless. Why did a certain person live a long life, another a short one, 
Why did someone make his entrance on the stage of history when he did, and neither earlier nor later? There's always a temptation to read rational sense into physical events. Thus, when Goethe, when Goethe was 64 years old, he once startled a visitor by talking as though death were an intentional act of the organism. He said that, quote, Raphael was barely in his 30s and Kepler hardly in his early 40s, which is by a mistake, by the way. Kepler hardly in his early 40s when both suddenly put an end to their lives, whereas the poet Wieland lived to be 80. And when the visitor objected to this notion, Goethe replied that it was a liberty he often permitted himself to take. He then, <laughs> he then proceeded to, improv to improvise a natural philosophy according to which the ultimate constituents of all beings persist in time according to a hierarchical order. It is tempting enough for an artist like Goethe accustomed to shaping imaginary worlds in conformity with an underlying meaning to treat the entrances and exits of human beings as though they were the behavior of orchestra players who perform according to the score. History is subdivided into periods and styles depending on how their characteristics are defined and to whom they are attributed. In relation to these periods, we envision individuals placed centrally or at, as transitional bridges. We pair and group them, see them as companions, adversaries, or followers. All these relations are not so much chronological as they are structural. And the structural relations tend to be experienced as spatial. Since knowledge of history is not primarily a learning of dates, but the formation of an image in whose pattern each fact and personage finds its place, it would be interesting to study the answers of semi-educated people to questions about the birth and death date of prominent persons or the years in which certain events take place. Mistakes, that is deviations from the correct dates, are often due not to a random guessing, but to the placement assigned to the person or fact in the historical image which the person has developed. I myself remember having often been surprised to discover that great men were still alive while I was a student. The independence and completeness of their work and their identification with the period of the past seemed to militate against any overlap with my own location. How could an impressionist or the founder of psychoanalysis or a leader of the Russian Revolution still be around while I was living in the next chapter of history? <laughs> By the same token, it will seem anachronistic to some that Claude Monet still lived and painted in the years of Cubism whereas others will locate him comfortably in our century because they consider his influence on the abstract impressionists of the 40s. Not that he lived in the 40s, but the influence in our century. If someone conceives of Michelangelo as having had a substantial part in the early Renaissance, it may come as a surprise to him to find that in 1500 the artist was only 25 years old. And similarly, if one thinks of Michelangelo and Leonardo as a pair of parallel figures, one may be disturbed by the fact that one of them was born 23 years earlier than the other, while the other lived 45 years longer. Structural relations suggest spatial configurations within our image of history. And if the chronological dates do not fit them, too bad for the dates. Depending on which role one attributes to the Council of Trent, the earthquake of Lisbon, or the invention of photography, one will assign them their places, 
correctly or more or less incorrectly. Let me return for a moment to Goethe's tempting thought that a person's lifespan is determined by a rational decision. Viewed in that way, long and short lives appear not so much as biological accidents, but as displays of various structures whose character depends on their length, just as a short piano piece or lead offers different opportunities than a grand opera. The long lives of a Titian or Cezanne are experiments with extended structures, as distinguished from the short ones of a Van Gogh or Georges Seurat. A long life of activity, by its dependence on the biological curve of youth, maturity, and decline, suggests distinctive qualities for each phase of the work, whereas the short life goes with the incompleteness of a fragment or the rapid unfolding of an early and final flower. We tend to impose a curious interaction on the relation between the chronological length of a person's life and the substance he invested in it. Thus, although both Beethoven and Marcel Proust lived about 50 years, we may think of the composer's life as incredibly compacted because it reaches from the courtly music of the 18th century to the tragically modern discords of the late work, whereas Proust's life may seem spread like a gossamer if we see it as given to a single work toned to a persistent color. Since I began with a reference to man's coping with the perishable nature of all physical presence, I will conclude by mentioning two conceptions that continue to offer serenity to believer and unbeliever alike. One of them transcends the limitations of the individual by embedding the single lifespan in the perpetual being or flow of a superordinate existence. This image takes the form of a relay pattern in the doctrine of the transmigration of souls, or less dynamically proposes a permanent world soul of which the individual is a partial manifestation. A psychological version of this view was alive in Marcel Proust when he wrote, for a man of genius can never give birth to works that will not die unless he that will not die unless he creates them in the image not of the mortal being he is but of the example of mankind he carries within himself in some way his thoughts are loaned to him during his lifetime of which they are the companions at his death they return to humanity and teach it, unquote. And translated into the philosophy of a scientist, a similar view is reflected in the reply given by Albert Einstein when he lay gravely ill and was asked whether he was afraid of death. He said, I feel so much solidarity with every living thing that it makes no difference to me where the individual begins or leaves off. The other source of serenity I have in mind derives from the translation of temporal events into the spatial realm of imagery. I have pointed out that only the coexistence of things in space enables us to see them in their wholeness to put them in relation to others and to organize them in systems. Such spatial images of small configurations or of worldwide ones serve the man of action as a means of orientation, a kind of map by which he finds his bearings in the dimension of time. A person given to contemplation, however, a thinker or artist, or simply someone whose life internalizes itself 
through the effect of advancing age, can afford to say with the philosopher Edmund Husserl that, quote, for the consideration of essences, the difference between direct perception and mere reminiscence is irrelevant. He tends to cultivate the world of his images as the real one, a world in which presence and persistence depends on value, and in which the access to his masters, his friends, lovers, and loved ones no longer requires that they be among the living. It is a world in which past events are available for retrieval, and where precious objects are safe from vandals and from the assets of the chemical industry. Apples and peaches may rot in peace once their portrait has been painted, and, from, and, and what the bee collects from the frailty of flowers turns into the substance from which the hive is built. In the safety of the timelessness of space, we appreciate the ancient words of Alcmeon, a Pythagorean philosopher, who taught that men die for this reason, that they cannot join the beginning to the end. Thank you. <laughs>